outline of the lecture is as follows. First, I'll talk about measuring economic growth, so how economic growth is commonly measured. Then I'll present some trends in economic growth in the developing world. In that part of the lecture, we'll see that the majority of developing countries are growing less fast than developed countries. But there is a substantial minority of developing countries that are catching up, so that are growing faster than developed countries. I'll give some examples of these countries and I'll present some of the factors that these have in common. The presentation of the factors that they have in common leads us into a reflection on the more fundamental causes of economic growth. And I'll be arguing that institutions hold the key to understanding economic growth. I'll be explaining later in the lecture what I mean by institutions. If it is the case that institutions hold the key to understanding lack of economic growth over a sustained period of time, then the question becomes, why is it that poor countries have such bad institutions? And one possible explanation for that has to do with their colonial origin, the fact that during a period in their history they were colonies. And I'll be presenting that possible explanation for bad institutions towards the end of the lecture. So let's begin. Measuring economic growth. Economic growth is measured as a change in gross domestic product per capita. Per capita means per head of the population. And gross domestic product is the sum of the gross value added by all resident producers in the economy. Forget about the term gross for now. Um, but let's focus on the term value added. Value added is the value of the products or services produced minus the costs of intermediate inputs. So, for example, if I'm a bike producer, then in my bike factory I may need rubber for the tires, so rubber is an intermediate input, and metal for the frames, metal is another intermediate input. And when the bike is finished, it will have a, a certain value, a certain price that I can fetch for it. And when we subtract the costs of the intermediate inputs, then we have a measure of the value that I have added through the production of this bike to the economy. And if we do that for all goods and services that are produced in the economy, we add it all up, then we have the sum of the value added, or in other words, we have gross domestic product. There are some technical parts to the definition as well, mentioned in points 2 and 3 um, of the slide, but I will not focus on these. They are not important for the purpose of this lecture. Next, I'll present some trends in economic growth in the developing world. First, since 1820. 1820 is chosen because from that uh, time onwards, some countries started taking advantage of the Industrial Revolution, whereas others did not. Now, interestingly, all of today's poor nations for which we have data were at or near the bottom in 1820. So it means that if you are poor now, you were also poor then. And of the countries that were at the bottom in 1820, um, the majority largely stayed there. Whereas the richest countries, countries that were rich already in 1820, increased their incomes by a factor of 10 or more. So read that sentence again. The countries that were at the bottom in 1820 largely stayed there. So the majority stayed at the bottom, but there is also a group that is catching up. And we'll talk about these a bit later on. Another way of saying that the richest countries increase their incomes by a factor of 10 or more is that more than 90% of their income has been created since 1820. And income in that sentence means income per capita, income per head of the population, and in real terms of corrected for, uh, for inflation. So most of the wealth creation in the world, when you think of it, in terms of 
per head of the population has taken place since 1820, since uh, the time when countries started taking advantage of the Industrial Revolution. What is then interesting is whether since the um, time that former colonies became independent, whether they were then able to take advantage of all these technologies that were now around uh, in, in, in the world. Um, so, is it the case that since 1960, since the, 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 the time that many former colonies, especially in, in Africa, um, became independent, is it the case that since then poor countries are catching up with, uh, with rich countries? First look at the richest 20% of countries. Since 1960, the median growth among them is 2.4% per capita per year. The median means the middle observation. So if we rank all countries from the slowest growers to the fastest growers, or in this case, if we rank the 20% of richest countries from the, from the slowest growers to the fastest growers, then the, um, the country right in the middle is the, the one that uh, has 2.4% growth per capita per annum. Um, when we then look at the poorest 80% of countries, 70% of these um, grew more slowly than the richest 20% of countries, but 30% grew faster. So there is a substantial minority that is catching up with uh, the rich countries. And we'll see a few examples uh, in a minute. And then very worryingly, the poorest 40% of countries, many of these in sub-Saharan Africa, Many of these have just gained their independence. Among these, there is virtually no growth. So even independence was not enough for taking advantage of the new technologies that now were around in the world. Here are some examples of developing countries that are, that are catching up. Um, on this slide, we look at Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia. First look at the high-income countries. Their um, GDP per capita, expressed in uh, dollars uh, of US dollars of the year 2000, so that all these figures are comparable. Uh, their GDP per capita in 1960 was about eight and a half thousand, and it grew to just under thirty thousand in the year uh, 2008, and that corresponds with uh, 3.4 percent uh, growth in GDP per capita per year between 1960 and 1980 and uh, just under 2% between 1980 and 2008. Um, when we compare Malaysia with that, uh, during that entire period, uh, between 1960 and 2008, their growth rates were faster than uh, the high-income countries. And that means that, whereas in 1960, high-income countries were um, about ten times as rich per head of the population, on average, as uh, Malaysia. By 2008, that had decreased to their being six times as rich. So there's still a massive gap, but the gap is closing. Um, likewise, for Indonesia, Indonesia was 40 times, um, or the high-income countries were 40 times as rich uh, as Indonesia in 1960, but only about 30 times as rich um, in 2008. I say only, I shouldn't have said that because it's still a, a big gap. But Indonesia is catching up as well. Um, so you see that the differences in growth rates in the last two columns, if they are sustained over decades, then that means that over time countries are catching up with the richest countries. Um, here are two other examples. Both of these countries, as you probably know, have a population well over 1 billion. Um, in 1960, um, high-income countries were 85 times as rich as, uh, as China. And in 2008, they were 15 times as rich. Still a big gap, but the gap is rapidly closing. And that has to do with these growth rates that you see in the last two columns. Between 1960 and 1980, China ma managed a 3% growth in GDP per capita, but since 1980 they managed an astonishing 9% growth in GDP per capita, or 8.8, .8, nearly 9%. And that leads to a 
a rapid closing of the gap between between China and the high-income countries. India, between 1960 and 1980, grew very slowly, but since 1980, they have started growing fast as well. And that leads to uh, a closing of the gap as well. So in 1960, um, the ratio between the income of high-income countries and India was uh, 45 to 1, and in 2008, it's 40 to 1. Massive difference, but the gap is closing. And before you think that this is only a matter of Asian countries uh, catching up with uh, with high-income countries, um, or Asian developing countries catching up with high-income countries, and that is not entirely the case. Here is an example of a country in Africa that is catching up. The vast majority of countries in Africa are not catching up, but Botswana is. In 1960, the ratio of income in high-income countries to the income of Botswana was 35 to 1. In 2008, it's 6 to 1. And they managed this through an astonishing growth rate, especially in the earlier decades. But they're still growing fast, even since 1980. Now, what have these countries that are catching up in common? What are the success factors? One is openness to trade. When a country is open to international trade, it can specialize in the products that it is good in, it can export those and import those products in whose production they are, they are somewhat less efficient. So as a result of that, they can specialize and become more productive. So that is one factor. I'm not suggesting here that if a country wants to become rich, that all it needs to do is to open its borders to international trade, because the country needs to be ready for that openness as well. The second factor that has characterized these countries that are catching up is macroeconomic stability. That means factors such as low inflation, budget and trade deficit. I won't be talking about these now because that's a huge separate topic. A third factor is a pro-business policy environment. So there is no excessive regulation, um, there are no excessive taxes, contracts are enforced, and so forth. The fourth factor is rapid human capital growth. So, in countries that are growing fast, in the, among the developing countries that are growing fast, we see a, a rapid rise in the skills that people have. They're becoming more ed educated, they're becoming more skilled. Um, now, unfortunately, you can't turn it around. You can't say, well, in that case, let's invest in education and economic growth will follow. For, so, because, for instance, during the 1960s, 70s and 80s, the growth in educational capital in Sub-Saharan Africa was actually faster than uh, that in East Asia. Uh, but East Asian countries grew much faster than Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, despite that massive investment in education, saw virtually no growth. So, um, countries that grow fast may be characterized by rapid human capital growth, but it doesn't mean that when you invest in human capital, that then growth will follow. It's more complicated than that, and we'll go into the complexity in a minute. Um, human capital growth is, though, more a success factor than uh, investment in physical capital, machines, and factories, and so forth. Uh, that takes place as well, of course, in these countries, but it appears to play a subsidiary role, a less important role than investment in, uh, in education. As I was saying um, a moment ago, uh, these factors are success factors, but they are not fundamental causes. Um, Fundamentally, for economic growth to take place, the institutions have to be right. And institutions you can think of as, uh, as the rules of the game in a, uh, in a society. Um, norms and laws and, and ways of doing things. And when you think about it in that way, um, institutions that are good for economic growth are institutions that 
facilitate transactions, for example. Um, when you think about things like money and contract enforcement, it, it, it greatly increases the efficiency of transactions. It becomes much easier to trade when you have a medium such as money, or if you know that when you have a contract with somebody far away, or, or a contract about the delivery of goods at some future period uh, of time, when you can trust that these contracts will be enforced, uh, then you're much more likely to engage in, 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 a, in a transaction. So institutions that facilitate transactions are conducive to growth. Other institutions that are good for growth are institutions that authorize the implementation of viable investment projects. That may sound a little bit abstract, but what I mean here is that if somebody in a, in a country has a as a good idea for uh, for an investment, for a, for a new product or for a more efficient way of producing something, then that idea needs to be um, recognized and there needs to be something in place that then makes that idea happen. The implementation of that investment project, which is viable, so it's a good idea, it will be profitable and so forth, um, the implementation of that needs to be authorized. If you have a, um, a, a capitalist society, then the, the common way of authorizing such an investment project is through financial institutions, for example, uh, banks. So there will be, be loans or there will be equity that, um, that finances the investment project and then makes it happen. But the general principle here is that there needs to be an institution in a society that recognizes viable investment projects and then authorizes their implementation. And finally, the owners of the factors of production need to be protected. So, for instance, if I am an entrepreneur and I have a good idea for the investment of a new product, then I need to trust that when I have made that product and have sold it, that I'll be allowed to keep the profits um, and that nobody will seize my factory. Um, because if I can't trust that, I may not risk carrying out that investment. So property rights need to be broad-based, they need to be there for the majority of the population, for everybody even, um, and these rights need to be enforced. So these, in a nutshell, are the institutions that are conducive to growth. Now, if those hold the key to understanding economic growth, then it stands to reason that um, countries that don't manage to grow have bad institutions. So, for instance, and I'll just focus on that example, um, property rights are not properly enforced. Indeed, when you look at uh, many poor countries today, it is the case that the property rights of a minority are well protected, but the property rights of a majority are not. And that in turn means that the majority of the population do not have the incentives to produce, because they will not be able to trust that they can hold on to, their, uh, um, to the profits that they make through their investment. Um, so, in other words, poor countries are often characterized by predatory governments. The property rights of a minority are protected, but not the property rights of the majority. And why could that be? Um, and one possible explanation is the fact that these countries are former colonies. And this um, explanation is associated with the American economist Darren Asimoglu. And his name is spelled, his surname is spelled A C E M O G L U, if you want to look him up. And that explanation goes roughly as follows When Europeans started colonizing the planet around uh, 1500, the countries where they settled in their masses tended to be sparsely populated and far from the equator. 
because in the tropical countries they would often die from yellow fever and malaria. So the Europeans settled in New Zealand, in the USA, or what is now the USA, Canada and uh, Australia. In those places they established institutions such as property rights that they themselves had to, to, uh, to live under. But in tropical countries they established, or in some cases reinforced, extractive institutions. They did not, not live their, themselves in their, in their masses, and their primary purpose was to extract resources from these uh, countries. So often they hired underlings that are willing to implement extractive institutions. So, for instance, it could be the case that the, the, the property rights of a particular minority ethnic group were protected, uh, but not the property rights of the majority, this minority ethnic group would work together with the colonizers and they would facilitate the extraction of resources from these countries. Both the colonizers uh, and that minority ethnic group benefited from this arrangement, but the majority of the population did not. Now, after independence, it would still be the case that this minority group uh, would benefit from the institutions that were um, put in place during the colonial era. So you can understand that after independence, they, this group would be very reluctant to give up these rights. Um, and that's why they have a tendency to persist, because they will hold on to, uh, to these uh, privileges and uh, other groups may fight them for it, uh, but then a period of social conflict, of civil conflict, uh, or of social conflict, uh, results that also is not conducive to the establishment of, uh, in this example, broad-based property rights. So I've not been able to talk about it for long, but I've been trying to explain that the reason that bad institutions persist, and uh, as a result of that, that economic growth it does not happen, may have to do with the fact that uh, countries that are poor nowadays uh, tend, have tended to be uh, uh, colonies of European colonizers. But we've also seen that there are um, developing countries that are, uh, that are catching up. Thank you very much for listening.